This is Coordinator's Corner, presented by JCW's The Burger Boys. We are live in Studio B from BYU Broadcasting in Provo, Utah for week five of Coordinator's Corner with BYU Football. I'm your host, Spencer Linton, wherever and however you're connected. Great to have you with us. Another loaded show today includes an in-depth recap of BYU's first ever Big 12 Conference game, a battle of two 3-0 teams, BYU falling short in Lawrence to the Jayhawks 38-27. So with the Cougars now 3-1, Coach Satake and company will work to rebound in their first Big 12 home game when they host Cincinnati this Friday night. Our esteemed guests on today's show are defensive coordinator Jay Hill and offensive coordinator Aaron Roderick. And we kick off today's show with BYU defensive coordinator, safeties coach, and associate head coach Jay Hill. Coach, welcome back to the show. Yeah, good to be with you. All right. How do you, because you've done this for a long time, how do you navigate mentally a frustrating setback, and then get right on a short week? What, what do you do? Well, I think you just abide by the process, right? You show up to work Monday and you get going on Cincinnati this week. And you got to get the players' minds back right. Um, not all was lost. I mean, everyone wanted to win that game last Saturday, but not all's lost. We're sitting here three and one. we got a bright future. we got a team coming in here that I feel we can play really good against. We get our own home crowd. Uh, that we get to play in front of. So uh, there's a lot to look forward to this week. After seeing the film, and I know you've watched it at length on the flight home from Kansas, you waste very little time. You get right at it. And then through the weekend, how would you rate the overall performance of the BYU defense against Kansas? Well, too hot and cold. I thought we played very well in the first half. I mean, we hold one of the top offenses in the Big 12 to 120 yards in the first half. Uh, we had two opportunities for interceptions. We had the quarterback frustrated. Uh, I mean, the preseason Big 12 player of the year, the quarterback only had 120 yards passing against us. So there's so many good things we did, but bottom line, uh, a lot to clean up, especially in the second half in the run game. Hey, you got a critical fourth down stop where you turn them over there. And then what most BYU fans thought should have been an interception by Cam Garrett. When you're dealing with a frustrated player like that, what do you say to them? When you too feel like, ah, it probably wasn't a holding call, we should have the ball, but that happens and there's nothing you can do to control it. Well, if we're playing defense the way we want to play in the secondary, I want those guys to be aggressive and I want them to go after the wide receivers. And you're going to get a PI here and there. You're going to get some holding calls here and there. If we're doing it the right way, um, it just happened to be on an interception. Uh, what you want, though, when those occur, you want the defense to respond and get out of the drive, and that was their only scoring drive of the first half. Yeah, interestingly enough. Uh, you mentioned how pleased you were with the, with the way the defense showed up and especially slowed down Jalen Daniels in the first half. What was the biggest challenge in defending against him in the Kansas offense? Well, he's very good at running the ball. Uh, he, there were a couple times we tried some drop eight coverage against him, and he's very poised. He just sits back there, holds the ball, pats it, runs around a little bit, and then finally finds a wide receiver to throw it to. And then he throws it well. I mean, you just look at him and his stats he's had over the years. When he plays and he's healthy, he's a great player. That's why he's the preseason Big 12 player, offensive player of the, of the year. And so. Anyway, bottom line, I thought we did a lot of good things against him, um, fell short, and I didn't love the way we responded in the second half. Yeah, and we'll get to the specifics of that. Um, as far as the first half goes, to the credit of BYU as a collective team, you watch that first defensive touchdown happen when Parker gets rocked and, and Kansas goes in, and BYU responds, and then the defense steps up, and you have a halftime lead uh, after kicking a field goal with all that momentum. So what, what do you do? To, to try and get the energy right when it happens a second time, especially when your, your defense has, has got to go back out there again with the frustrating deficit. Well, one thing I'll say is I think the offense has actually done a phenomenal job of responding to those moments as well because, you know, they give up the score early and then they went right back on the attack mode and I thought they played very well the rest of the first half. And like you said, we go into halftime with the lead. Uh, those things happen in football. We got to do a better job defensively respond to the second one and find a way to get out of drives in the second half. If we do that, we're going to give the offense the ball right back to do what they did in the first half. And that, that again, I've said it before, that was my frustration in we needed to find a way out of a drive or two more than we did yeah. in the second half. And if we do, the offense is going to get the ball, go down and score, and we're going to be fine. 
Kansas seemed to find a little bit more success running the ball in the second half, specifically Tyler Batty and A.J. Vongpachan told me after the game that we, got, we need to stop the run better, especially in the second half. How do you see that? And, and did they do something different? Did they make an adjustment, or was it just fatigue and some injuries? How, how did that all factor? No, I think it was more self-inflicted. we got to fit the counter play better, and then we did not do a good job adjusting to their empty which is something we do work and we've been running since the start of fall camp. We got to do a better job adjusting to their empty formation, which they were getting into to try to run the ball um, and give Kansas credit. I mean, they, they've, they've got an explosive offense. They made a bunch of big plays. Uh, they did a lot of good things in the second half. We, we, we need to do a little better job adjusting with them. So if you were to pinpoint the number one lesson that your defense can learn from a game and experience like this as you open up Big 12 play, what would you centralize that message on just there's going to be ups and downs in a game you got to stay the course there were ups and downs in the first half we stayed the course we held them to 120 yards if we do the same thing in the second half we're going to win that game and uh we didn't so you can't let frustration set in you can't try to start making things up and i felt like we did that myself included uh, we tried to in our adjustments, we tried to make some things up that we shouldn't have and just stay the course. It's a long game. I'm guessing you probably already answered this question because my follow-up is, what are you going to say to your guys today when, when you really get into the details with them and, and address a new week with Cincinnati approaching? Well, I think we're sitting in a good spot. We're 3-1. and one. We played good football. We beat a really, really good Arkansas team that we saw go into LSU and almost win on the road in, in the SEC. Uh, we were right there in the first half, even with the mistakes we made on beating a good Kansas team on back-to-back -back road games, Power 5 road games. So uh, not all's lost. we got to stay the course. It's a long season. Hardly anybody goes undefeated. Let's, let's take what we just went through, take the adversity, learn from it, grow from it, and let it make us stronger. How would you explain the atmosphere and the feeling around the staff right now after the first loss of the season? Well, downhearted. I mean, coaches want to win every game. I promise you this. The fan, <laughs> fans, you got to know this. The coaches want to win as much as anybody. Uh, we want to win as much as the players and the fans. And we're doing everything we can to right the ship and to get our players in the right positions. And we take it hard. When, 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 when I, as a defensive coordinator, don't put the players in the right positions to make all the plays, we take it hard. And we go right back to the drawing board on how do we do it this week versus Cincinnati. Um, but I know this, if you sulk and you whine and you let the players be downhearted too, then that's not the recipe for bouncing back and having success this week. Do you have a go-to to help get your mind right? Is there an escape that you need, like on Sunday or whatever, like I just need to get away, it's, whether it's hug your kids or watch a show, like what's your escape for a moment to get right? Just that, family. You know, when you hang out with your wife and kids, it puts everything right back in perspective for us because you want to, right? You want to be mad and you want to pout and whine for a little bit. But the, the reality is their life goes on, your family's life goes on, the players' lives go on, and not all's lost. Uh, as, as much as you want to put on every single game, the bottom line, if you, if you act in the way we're talking about, you're not going to bounce back and win this week. And we got to move on. Uh, players need to move on. Fans can move on, and just, just by doing so, I promise you there's going to be more optimism around the program and a much better chance of winning this week. Great stuff thus far from defensive coordinator and associate head coach Jay Hill. We have much more to come as we head to break. This reminder to join Dave McCann and former Cougar Blaine Fowler and David Nixon, Cougars I should say, tomorrow night for a brand new episode of After Further Review as they take a look at the Cougars' Big 12 opener at Kansas, recap it, and then look ahead to Cincinnati, 7 p.m. Eastern on the BYU TV app or ESPN+. Plus. Also on the way, we'll break down more from Lawrence with defensive coordinator Jay Hill, who earned his Defensive Player of the Week honor. This is Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. A three-step, now a five-step, a deeper drop. Pressure in on Daniels, and he is going down! A huge loss on the play, Ben Bywater. They showed the celebration twice because it was so nice from Ben Bywater. Uh, we'll get an update on his status in just a little bit. He went down with a little bit of an injury. Um, Jay Hill is with us as we look back on BYU's trip to Kansas. The defensive coordinator here, and you and I were just talking during the break about the increased parity of college football yeah. overall. You brought up Arkansas just about going to LSU and winning that game and, and I mean taking it down to the wire. 
why do you feel like there's such great parity in college football? Because to me, it didn't used to be this way. You used to have your juggernauts and then the rest, but it feels like every game is tough. Well, I think the recruiting process has changed a little bit. Um, I think there's more mistakes made in recruiting now than ever before, just because it's so much more accelerated than it used to be 10 years ago. Uh, the transfer portals change things where you can lose a spot and instead of having to go through the growing pains, if you do a good job in the transfer portal, you can you know get some quick fixes. I think that's add to some parity. And then the, the reality, I think kids are just figuring out across the country that you know what, I can play with the big boys and uh, yeah. there's more and more teams doing that. How do you feel like the newcomers and the transfers for BYU football? Uh, I know you already mentioned A.J. Von Pachan, uh, among others, have competed for this BYU defense thus far. Well, if you look at the transfers we took, you know, we got a bunch of starters. Jackson Cravens has played great and A.J. Von Pachan's played great. Eddie Heckard, Cam Garrett, those guys have played outstanding. Uh, Isaiah Banya's now started a bunch of games. So if you look at the transfers we took, those guys have solidified a lot of things and have played good football for us. Um, and it will be interesting going forward to see how the transfer portal continues to evolve. Yeah, fascinating stuff with Jay Hill. Uh, I mentioned Ben Bywater. We showed his sack out of the break. He's such an instrumental part of your defense. Goes down with what looked like a right shoulder injury. And I know you can't address specifics, but uh, at this point, what can you tell us about Ben's status and his availability moving forward? Well, obviously, phenomenal player, and the fans will get to know him as a stalwart just uh, within the defense and everything that he's done. When these injuries occur, you let the medical staff just take over, assess what's going on. We do MRIs and those kind of things. And that will usually take place today, tomorrow. We'll get a better assessment on exactly where he's at in the next couple of days. Now, worst case, if Ben cannot play, at that point, who steps in and, and helps fill the gap for him? Well, we've been rotating Har Harrison Taggart a lot, has played a lot. Uh, Cialia Serra is now back in the fold with us. Um, there's a lot of guys. Ace Kafusi has played some for us and had a great spring. So. You'll continue to see names that we've mentioned before. Um, and like I say, we hope we get Ben back soon. But yeah. if not, it's the next guy's job to step up and play great. I spoke recently with Talon Alfrey, and, and he's hopeful to be back. He told me by mid to, to late October. Um, what are you seeing from, from the progress there? And what will he do to help the safeties room, which you coach? Well, he'll help a lot. And um, Talon, when we lost him, we lost one of our great tacklers. We lost one of our great playmakers in that secondary. So, but but it's it's another great opportunity for you know a Tanner Wall or Ethan Slade or Malik, someone to step up and and play you know the way we need him to play. And but that's college football. If you yeah. whine and complain about injuries, that's what the losers do. The winners got to move on, and you got to find the next guy up. And the next guy up's got to play great. Well, because you are the safeties coach, naturally I need to ask you, how are the safeties performing <laughs> with Tanner Wall and Malik Moore and Ethan Slade? You know what? They've done a lot of good things this season. Uh, there's some things that we need to do it a little better. There's some adjustments that occurred in that game versus Kansas. You know, some of the empty checks that we needed to get into a little cleaner. Uh, we got to tackle a little bit better. For, but for the most part, I don't see that that group's um, hurt us at all. We just... You know, it's a, it's a constant evolution. We've got to continue to play and play better. Um, aside from Ben and, and the aforementioned talent, Alfrey, Micah Harper's out for the season. How is the health overall of your defense at this point, four games in? Well, you know, I'll, I'll say this uh, to our sports scientists and our strength coaches. I think they've done a phenomenal job of preparing our football team, knowing how many reps we can take, how many reps we need to take to stay healthy. I think they've done a phenomenal job of just managing exactly what we need to do to keep our guys healthy because four games in, uh, we're relatively healthy as a team. Defensive coordinator Jay Hill is with us. Offensive coordinator Aaron Roderick is going to join us at the bottom of the hour. Uh, but before he comes in, we need to name a defensive player of the week. Who have you chosen as your defender of the week? Well, he's played good all year, and he had another stalwart game. Uh, A.J. Vongpichon played really well. What is it that he's doing that is impressing you and, and jumps off the film, if you will? Uh, he's Mr. Steady. He, he's super smart, very instinctive, knows where he needs to be, and he's usually there. Uh, has been a great tackler in the open field, and he just brings a tenacity and a toughness to our defense that we really needed, and uh, he did it again uh, Saturday against Kansas. The defensive line was one of the biggest question marks coming into the season, and that's based on previous seasons and BYU not you know, getting a lot of 
havoc rate and not a lot of chaos back there in quarterback hurries. That seems to have changed. And it really, I mean, really showed out against Arkansas with that four man rush late in the game. Is that a stylistic change? Is it an attitude change, a uh, scheming thing? Like, how, why are you finding more success getting to the quarterback this year? Well, I think uh, confidence is a learned behavior and it's something that you got to earn. And I think confidence is growing within the defensive line group. That's tackles and defensive ends. And I think we'll get better and better as we continue to have more success. Now, I will say this, when we bring three and four man pressures, we still need to get after the quarterback a little bit better than we are. Um, but I see a lot of good in the progress. I think Coach Papinga and Coach Puha have done a great job of getting their guys to improve each week and to play at a high level. And again, I think that that's something that you'll see gets better and better as the season goes on. What's the relationship like with those gentlemen on the headset in the heat of battle? I don't know. They probably think I'm a jerk. I, I, get, so, <laughs> I get so emotional and yelling, and I'm just yelling at stuff, not necessarily at them or anybody. But, you know, we, we all wanted to be perfect, and I'll yeah. be the first to admit sometimes I probably need to calm down. And, and uh, But that's part of my personality. The players know it. They know I love it. They know I want to be great at everything we do. And uh, like I say, I have such a privilege to work with phenomenal coaches, some of the best in the country. And th this defensive staff, I think, has done a really good job. Um, and the good thing is, is there's a lot of room for improvement that we can keep getting better. Yeah, three and one and uh, still a lot of room to grow. Is, yeah. that's, that's a nice awesome. base to build from for sure. If you had to say the one thing through four weeks that you've been most impressed with from your defense, what would it be? And this is probably tough for you because yeah. I know you don't want to like throw out compliments necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I would say the way they've responded to adversity. You right. know, we go down big. We go down 14 to Arkansas. We come right back. We go down 10 in the second half, come right back. We get down first uh, drive in the Kansas game. We come right back. Uh, we had the opportunity in the um, Sam Houston game early where we run the fake punt. doesn't work. They're down inside our own 10-yard line. We get the interception. So I think – as a whole, the defense has responded very well to adversity and some of the things that, you know, you have to overcome to be a great defense. Okay, and then uh, in contrast, maybe what's your, your number one bit of criticism? or uh, And it can be constructive criticism. Yeah. When, when the offense is moving the ball against us right now, most of the time those are self-inflicted wounds where either I can make a much better call or whatever the call was in, we can do a better job of executing um, – a lot of it is self-inflicted, and uh, when we're on it, like we were the second half of Arkansas or the first half at Kansas, we've proven we can be a pretty good defense. All losses are, are tough to handle for sure. Is there something to, you know, the self-inflicted loss? Because Keaton Slovis said as much. He said, I felt like we just left. Yeah. We had a win, and we left it there. Yeah. We shot ourselves in the foot. Uh, are those tougher to overcome? They are. And I'm a poor loser, and um, <laughs> I'll be the first one to admit it. I, I hate losing. I for sure hate losing when it's things that we could have done better and, in my opinion, probably should have done better. But, again, if, if a football game was perfect, then it would be boring to watch, right? Amen. If there wasn't mistakes, then no fan would like it because you would know the outcome before it ever started. And that's part of why I love coaching is you have to overcome mistakes. You have to overcome adversity. You have to overcome some of the things that we did in this game and give Kansas credit. You know, their defense scored two, two touchdowns that game, and we didn't. Had we scored the two touchdowns, we would have won. And that's part of the challenge this week is how do we get the defense now to be what Kansas did last week and be the reason why we win. Uh, Coach, before we go to break and, and discuss a few questions about Cincinnati and what's going to happen in Provo on Friday, um, if you had to tab a special teams player of the week this week, who, who would you get the nod to there? Oh, you know what? I should have asked Coach Papinga that. Um, it's probably unfair. That was really one of those games where special teams was kind of a wash. Sure. And it doesn't happen much. Maybe Raider Demuni. Yes, I'm, I'm just being there told. <laughs> Coach Papinga chimed in. It's Raider Demuni and Will Farron. Okay, So there you're you on go. par. So, so Raider and Will. There you go. And, and you're right. Will made the field goal. Um, the field goals that were huge in that game. So those two probably deserve it.
Okay, one more break, and then we'll come back with a look ahead to Cincinnati with defensive coordinator Jay Hill. As we go to break, a reminder that dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality, and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and now open in Harriman. This Friday, as I mentioned, BYU plays its first ever home Big 12 conference game with the Cincinnati Bearcats visiting Lavelle Edwards Stadium under the Friday Night Lights. Tune in to Cougar Pregame Live on BYU Radio starting at 8 Eastern, 6 Mountain. Stay with us as we take a look at the Bearcats. You're in the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Coordinator's Corner on BYU TV is brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. You're in the Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. This is our final segment with BYU Defensive Coordinator and Safeties Coach and Associate Head Coach Jay Hill. This segment presented by Intermountain Health, official medical provider for BYU Athletics. Let's head to Cincinnati now. We're on to Cincinnati in the words of Bill <laughs> Belichick, Coach. We're on to Cincinnati. We're, we're putting Kansas to bed now. What do you know about Cincinnati's offense at this point? Well, I think it's a, very similar to Kansas. They'll spread you out, and the quarterback is a very good athlete. He can run all over the place. I like the running backs. Number eight, the wide receiver is very good. Um, he played last year at the University of Florida, and I think he had 36, 38 catches for Florida last year. They've shown that they can be dynamic, um, and they, like I say, they'll spread you out. They'll pack you in. They want to run the ball. For them to be the most effective, they want to run it. What type of run game do you expect from them is this like a is this like a power run game that they're going to bring yeah i think they do a good job of it they'll bring the tight ends and they'll lead block them on zone and wide zone um, they're creative in how they uh, gain leverage on the defense um, but you know it's it's a similar run scheme actually the way that we face each week against our own offense what does it mean to be home for the first time after playing back-to-back -back Power 5 games and now having your chance at a Big 12 home opener? Well, I can't wait to be back in front of our crowd and on a night game yeah. where the weather's supposed to be outstanding. Our crowd's going to be electric. I really believe it's going to be packed and packed early. And, and that's just its something that the players feed on. I hope Cougar Nation knows how important that is to our success and home field advantages. When they show up, show up early, they're there for the Cougar walk and everything that we do, it just adds an atmosphere of big time. And this is big time college football, and I can't wait for Friday night. I don't know what it is, but statistically, over – the Satake era, BYU just seems to play really well at night. What is it about a night game you think that factors into that? I don't know. Kalani's figured it out. I, I, I think the biggest thing is the fans. Uh, the fans at home, the, what, the atmosphere of that Sam Houston game was absolutely electric. And now we bring a good Big 12 team in here Friday night. Um, this is going to be one that you don't want to miss. And we can't wait for the atmosphere. I just think that's been a huge positive to Coach Satake's teams is that home field advantage. Yeah, Cincinnati played Oklahoma tough. They lose 20-6 to six on their home field. But, I mean, they slowed down an Oklahoma offense that has been pretty prolific uh, through the first quarter of the season. Um, they've got some players. They, they bring They're, some guys. This is a good football team. Yeah. Um, they beat Pitt. Um, they hung right there with Oklahoma last week. I mean, this is a good football team coming in. This is a Big 12, Power 5 football team that we're going to have to play good against to, to come out on top. Coach, you're a good sport. We appreciate you being <laughs> here and, and hanging out with us. Love your tenacity um, and your attention to detail. I'm grateful to have you at BYU. Yeah, heck yeah. Love being here. Let's go. Jay Hill, the defensive coordinator, wrapping up his segment on Coordinator's Corner. Uh, tomorrow night, you can watch BYU football with Kalani Satake. Enjoy a full hour of conversations with the coach and a player guest in front of a live Studio C audience. Watch Tuesday nights at 8.30 Eastern on the BYU TV app or ESPN+. Plus. Up next, our conversation with BYU offensive coordinator Aaron Roderick. As the coordinator's corner continues, we're brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Sprint right for Slovis. Guns it for the end zone. Wide open for the catch is Darius Lassiter. Uh, career best, eight catches for Darius Lassiter 
And a big touchdown. What a moment for him to be playing against his brother, Quinton. Catch that. And I'm sure they've been letting each other hear about it. Even though the game goes the way of Kansas, uh, knowing that relationship between those brothers, it, it, it has not stopped. Erica Lasseter, their mother, able to watch as well as their little brother, Quincy. Very, very cool individual thing for Darius Lasseter. And the Cougars certainly expect more from him. We'll be joined by Aaron Roderick in just a moment. A reminder, you're in the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. And speaking of the man of the hour, sliding in. These guys, I hope you know, they got a ton of work to do. They are super busy. Grateful to have you with us, Coach, uh, as you join me here for a look ahead to Cincinnati. But first, we look back at Kansas. Um, and I'll, I'll start with the same question I asked to Jay Hill. After the weekend, after you review, you review the film, what's your overall takeaway from BYU's performance as an offense against Kansas? Uh, well, I was pretty disappointed in how we played, and I didn't need to review the film to know that uh, the story of the game was we gave them 14 points on offense. You know, we just had uh, two disastrous turnovers that really cost us. You know, we, we lose the game by 11 points, and you spot the other team 14. That's not a good formula for winning. And so um, there are other things we need to work on, but that is the story of the game is the turnovers. Um, you know, we've been such a low turnover team over the years. It's been part of our formula for winning is that we take great care of the football. And um, Saturday we did not do that. And, it, it, you know, you can talk about a lot of the things that both sides of the ball can do better, sure. but that is the story. How do you go about rectifying something like that? Because, I mean, one of them is just an, just an unfortunate circumstance where it's an unbelievable hit and, and, and yeah. Parker fumbles the ball. So how do you rectify that? Yeah, it's an unbelievable hit, but we missed a block mm -hmm. on that play. You know, we missed we missed a key block that we had practiced and uh, didn't didn't make the block. We're, you know, we need to get that corner block there. The play dot was set up just like we had practiced it, and we just we just didn't execute it. And then, uh, um, you know, even when we get hit hard, hit hard we got to hold on to the ball. And then we we had an interception later in the game for a pick six that. Uh, on third and long, you know, one, one of the things that we always talk about here is let's not lose the game on third and long, let's, let's, especially in our third of the field. Let's play smart, take care of the football, and preserve our right to punt. And um, just an unfortunate play there. I like Keaton played a really good game, but he, he, he forced one right there a little bit. And um, we also didn't execute the play quite as, as it was planned. And, you know, when you're playing a good team and in this conference, the margin of error is small. You can't, yeah. make, you can't make those mistakes. It's hard not to feel like if just take away one of those defensive yeah. touchdowns, and maybe we're having a very different conversation. Very true. We, you know, we weathered the storm. The first, yeah. the first turnover was, uh, was, you know, obviously we don't want to have that happen, but we weathered it, and we got back in. We actually got the lead. Our team has shown a lot of resilience in the first, in, you know, in the last couple of games where we've gotten down, and we'll, we'll battle back. And so I'm really proud of our team for that. We're, we've got some competitors that don't back down from a challenge, and um, we don't fold when we get behind or anything like that. Um, but yeah, you can't keep, you can't make another one of those in a game, you know, against a team that's well coached and in these big 12 games, everybody's going to be squared away. And so you just can't afford to make those types of mistakes. Keaton throws the ball 51 times, goes for 357 yards, uh, through some beautiful passes, yeah. uh, after the adversity had happened. How would you, uh, rate your quarterback's play with the 51 pass attempts? Yeah, I thought he played a solid game in most respects. We had, uh, you know, like I said, one really disastrous mistake. We had another sort of miscommunication on another one between he and the receiver. Uh, you know, those things can happen. Like, you can overcome that. It, the, but the, the pick six is a tough one. Uh, the other part of the problem is we don't want to throw 51 passes. You know, we'd like to be 35-40 and and get some more production out of our run game. And um, we just it got to a situation where we were struggling to run the ball, and so we had to throw it 51 times. And um, if you throw 51 passes, there's a good chance there's going to be an interception or two in there somewhere. You know, that's why we'd rather get more balance going with our run game yeah. and our passing game, complementing each other. And then uh, that's a formula for being able to take better care of the football. It's you're, not, you're less predictable. The defense isn't pinning their ears back. and you're not getting their, all their junk coverages and stuff. They have to defend the run, and we, we need to fix that too. Offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach Aaron Roderick is with us on the coordinator's corner. Let's stay with that run game topic. Was it something that Kansas was doing that was giving you a hard time, or do you feel like this is self-inflicted in the run game? It's a little bit of both. I mean, you've got to give them credit. They're a good team, and they're well-coached, and they played hard. Um, I think we need, to, we need to play better, though. We need to block better as a unit. 
um, at all positions, we need to be better blockers. Um, we need to be, we need to run where we're supposed to run and break tackles, and we need to block better as a unit. Where uh, too many missed blocks on the perimeter, you know, obviously our offensive line gets the most of the, most of the attention, and they need to play better as well. Tight ends need to play better. We just we need to be better blockers. Where do you begin as a staff uh, in team meetings and preparation to to rectify something like that? Where does it begin? Well, it just it begins with the personal accountability. You know, everyone needs to recognize their role in it. The run game is an 11-man deal. We've been a very good rushing team the last three years, and um, we, you know, we're running the same offense. We we know how to do this. We just need to execute, and each player needs to recognize what he needs to do better instead of saying, well, it's the offensive line or it's the running backs or it's the tight ends or, you know, it's the coach not calling the right play or whatever. If, I think if we just get everybody dialed into how they can execute their assignment better, we can get that thing turned around. So let's talk about turning it around. Like in your mind, what would a turnaround product look like? Like what, what would, what's the next step to tell you, okay, we're moving in the right direction? Just achieving uh, some balance on early downs. You know, we're, we're getting into too many third and long situations. And, um, you know, again, talk about turnovers. When you're, in, when you're in a lot of third and longs, that's what defenses want, right? They love to, to bring in their sub packages and blitz you and give you the funky coverage that they practiced all week for, you know. But when you're in third and two, third and three, you know, third and one, those situations, now it's adva advantage to the offense. And so, we need to have some success running the ball in early downs, um, and so, you know, that would be just that'd be a start. Not even not even talking about explosive runs or long touchdown runs right now. Just need to get some consistency at some early down run plays, and um, we will fix it. We're we're working on it right now, and and um, it's it's an issue that we need to address for sure. We're with Aaron Roderick on the coordinators' corner. With Daryl Funk coaching the offensive line, and I mean, what's your communication like with him? Do you do you rely heavily on him to to coordinate the run game? Like, how how is that relationship working? Yeah, we all work together on the run game. It's uh, Daryl, myself, Steve Clark. Um, you know, we have input from other guys on the staff as well. Our an our analysts give give input on things, um, and. Uh, Harvey and even Fessy's involved in the run game as well. We all are because because the run game truly is an 11 man thing. It's not just the five offensive linemen. The five linemen can only block five people. Mm -hmm. There's 11 people on defense. So you need to get nine of the 11 blocked every play. And then your ball carrier's got to make somebody miss. And hopefully you're a good enough passing team that you can make at least one safety stay deep. Uh, you know, yeah. and that's 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 part of it. So. Um, it, it's an 11 man problem and, or 11 man issue right now and all all the coaches on the staff are all working together to make it better. Yeah, speaking of the running backs, you lead me to my next question. How would you assess their performance to this day and, and LJ Martin as a true freshman? Yeah, I would say LJ's done some really good things. He is a freshman, so he's learning every game. Like he has experiences each game that, you know, well that's the first time that's happened, so you know, you learn from it. And that's normal. That's normal. But he's doing a lot of good things. He's a really tough runner. He's a great kid, great character kid. And I know uh, he's just going to get better and better every game. All right. Great stuff from Aaron Rodwick thus far. Time for a break. As we step away for a moment, this reminder that you can get ready for Friday night's clash between new Big 12 foes, BYU and Cincinnati, with BYU Sports Nation game days expanded to our pregame coverage at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 Mountain Time, live on BYU TV when we come back more with A-Rod as he takes us through the second half in Lawrence. And we'll get to the Offensive Player of the Week nomination as the Coordinator's Corner continues. Brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Back with more right after this. Coordinator's Corner on BYU TV is brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Siegfried and Jensen, helping Utah families for over 30 years. And by Smith's. Low prices, market fresh. We are live in Studio B with the Coordinator's Corner, reviewing BYU's Big 12 opener at Kansas last Saturday afternoon with BYU Offensive Coordinator and Quarterbacks Coach Aaron Roderick. And Coach, um, we were talking about it during the break. We'll, we'll go right to the illegal touching penalty because after review, 
It, it didn't look like BYU had actually committed the penalty. So walk us, walk us through what happened there and why BYU was called for it again. Well, they told us that Keelan Marion covered up the tight end, but on video he didn't. And also you can see him confirming with the ref. He points to her, says, I'm off. She tells him he's off. So, But the official on Kansas' sideline all the way across the field called the penalty on us. And uh, even though Keelan had done what we coached, he had, con he had confirmed it with... Uh, the official next to him. So tough call. It was that was a tough break. I, I uh, when I look at the video, it looks to me like we're in a legal formation, and uh, I don't agree with it. But it's a tough one that you know it just one of those things. Um, we got to just do a better job of not even making it close. I guess uh, you know we want to crowd the ball, but um, can't make it close. How do you not let something like that? frustrate your guys and the staff it's just part of the game you know that some days when it rains it pours and you just got to play through it and um you know and that's one of the challenges of this week is hey we're, we're three and one we got a great chance friday night to get our fourth win yeah and the beauty of being in the big 12 now is if you lose a game you flush it and it's a one game season the next week and then you just keep checking those standings every monday and see where you're at yeah and, so it's not like all is lost. It's uh, disappointing because we should have won that game. We feel like we should have won that game, but um, putting it behind us, and now all the focus is on winning Friday night against Cincinnati. I spoke with Jay Hill about this. Because it is a game that you feel like you left on the field, and those are the words of Keaton Slovis. Like, we left a win on the field. Like We mm -hmm. shot ourselves in the foot. For you, are those tougher to get over? For sure, yeah. I mean... When you when you go out there and give it your all and play, you know, plays, you know, at least close to your potential, and you lose and you put it all out there. I mean, uh, we're all competitors. We all want to win, but you know, sometimes that happens. But it's disappointing when it's so many, you know, self-inflicted things. And uh, Saturday, we you know, Kansas is a good football team, but we feel like we beat ourselves in a lot of ways. Well, you had a number of pass catchers do some great things. Isaac Rex was very busy. He was targeted 13 times. He had seven catches. Darius Lasseter had a career-high eight catches. Keelan Marion did some great things. What would you like from your pass catchers and your route runners on Saturday? Yeah, one of the positives of right now of our offense is we're explosive. We can throw the ball down the field. We're making a lot of plays in the passing game. Our pass protection has been very solid. Uh, and, you know, The few times that we've had issues have been Again, when we're putting ourselves in third and long situations, but even those, we've converted a good number of third and longs. Um, so our, our passing game is uh, coming together. It's getting better each game. It's not by no means that we arrived, but I do think we can throw the ball down the field, and um, I'm excited about how those guys are getting better each game, a lot of, a lot of new faces, um, and uh, we just need to continue to make the whole offense fit together a little bit better with our run game. Hey, you got a pass to set up the run, so be it. BYU's yeah. been known to do that a few times in the past. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I do think we can, you know, maybe we can, we can win games throwing a few more passes than we have the last few years, but we do need to uh, shore up that run situation. So, and going back to the run game, because it's four games in, I don't know how drastic of a change or, or desperation that you, you're feeling at this point. Maybe it's none, but like, do you consider an overhaul of the run game going I formation or something different, <laughs> power game? Like, what, what do you consider? Well, you can't do a complete overhaul in the middle of the season. You know, when, when you uh, consider how many, you get 15 practices in spring, you get 29 in fall camp, so that's 44. And then you get a 12-week season where you practice three times a week. So by the time you play your first game, your practice season is more than halfway over. And so to make a complete overhaul is very hard to do. The chances of you actually being good at something by Saturday is not, not very high. But what we do need to do is get back to basics, the basic fundamentals of being better blockers at all positions, yeah. finishing blocks, executing our offense, uh, um, running where we're supposed to run. Um, breaking tackles, those things, just the core fundamental things. The system works. It's been proven to work the last few years, um, and we just need to improve at it. I've had a number of fans ask, well, why don't they just change this? And so I wanted to give you an yeah. opportunity to address that. Yeah, that's very hard to do at this stage. I mean, you can maybe do a thing or two on a bye week or something like that, but, I mean, you're talking about three practices per week where you're, you know, we know exactly how many number of reps we get. And we have it down to a science. We get this many practice reps, and you carry a certain number of plays in the game, and each of those plays are going to get so many reps. And to completely install new schemes or something like that yeah. 
um, is a recipe for even, you know, for things to go even worse. You've been doing this for a long time and you've had great success in the recent past, Aaron, and, and the, the past game is going. How would you define your play calling status at this juncture of your career? How would I define it? Yeah, like your style. I don't know if I can define it, but I, I feel like, um, you know, the more you do it, the more you learn how to handle different situations. And, and um, you know, this is a situation right now where uh, we have some struggles we got to work through, but I also feel really confident in our players and in the situation we're in at three and one. We've actually scored quite a, quite a bit of points. When you consider how, how uh, our, our production in the run game hasn't been great, the number of points we're putting up is encouraging when you look at, okay, if we can fix a few things there, then the point totals are going to go up, the turnovers go down, and um, you know, that's going to be our formula for getting back to how we used to play and winning games you know, with, with being physical and taking care of the football. Well, like it or not, your team has shown that they can overcome adversity. I know you don't want to yeah. have to overcome so much adversity, but you're showing that. Hey, it's the Big 12, and it's going to be a four-quarter dogfight every single week. And so get used to it. It's going to be like this. All right. Uh, a couple of quick questions before we take our break and look ahead to Cincinnati. Um, who earned your Offensive Player of the Week? Well, um, I thought Keelan had a good game, um, you know, in spite of that penalty, because I, I think he's, st I still believe he did the right thing, checking with the ref on that. And, um, but anyway, um, Keelan's doing some good things. He's, he is getting better each game. He's an explosive player, has a lot of speed, can get down the field, get, go get the deep ball. He's a good runner after the catch and um, proud, of, proud of how he's coming along. Okay, and now uh, just a status update. And I, I don't know how much you can speak to these injuries, but uh, we, we noticed a number of guys left the game for at least, you know, a few drives. Two notables on the offensive line, Waylon Lapuahu and Kingsley Suamata'i. What's their status moving forward? Yeah, um, Kingsley's fine, and, and then uh, Waylon, we'll learn more about him today where, where he's at. Um, I don't know the answer to that yet. Okay. I will hopefully know later. If Whalen is not available, who then steps in in his place? Saturday it was Ian Fitzgerald, and uh, I would expect it to be him again. Um, but we're, we're, we are constantly looking at everything right now. Anything we can do to get better is on the table right now. So we're looking at every option we have as a team at every position of how we can improve. Aaron Roderick with us and addressing uh, personnel situations with the BYU offense. Now for a couple of your pass catchers, what's the status with Cody Epps right now? Didn't play against Yeah, Kansas. same thing. Just He's still working through some stuff. He's, he's just not quite 100%. And so um, he made the trip. He warmed up for the game and, and um, ended up not being able to go. And it's... You know, he's frustrated, we're frustrated. I, that's really all I can say about it right now. Sure. I did want to mention, though, Kingsley did play his best game of the year Saturday. He, he, played, he, was, he was out for 15, 20 plays, something like that. But Came back he in. And he played, played very, very well. He had a really solid game and could have named him the player of the game. Okay. Just, he, just, he missed about 15, 20 snaps, but that was it. Duly noted. Yeah. All right, so questionable for Cody moving forward day to day. Safe to say that? Day to day, and I'm sorry I don't have better answers. It's just uh, it's that's how it is. It's just he's got to work his way through it. Okay, and then two others. Uh, people want to know about Parker Kingston, hoping he's okay. Yeah, I think he's gonna he's um, he's gonna be okay. I, I don't know if he's gonna be able to play this Friday with the short week or not. But we'll um, if he's ready, then we'll play him. And then finally, Aiden Robbins, who did not make the trip to Kansas last week in the running back room. Yeah, same. Aiden's Aiden's dealing with something right now um, that. Uh, might keep him out for a few more weeks, yep. And we're not sure exactly. It could be anywhere from a couple weeks to longer. We're not sure yet. Okay. Uh, we're not done yet. Time again for a break. Before we look ahead to Cincinnati, as we step away, we remind you to join us for our day-to-day -day BYU sports play-by-play -play hosted by myself and Jerem Jordan. Weekdays noon Eastern on BYU TV, simulcast on BYU Radio. Coming up in our final segment, Coach Roderick, Takes a look at the first Big 12 game in Lavelle Edwards Stadium. What does he know about the Bearcats defense? When the coordinator's corner continues, we're brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. You're in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. When BYU kicks off against Cincinnati under the Friday night lights of Lavelle Edwards Stadium, it will be just the third ever meeting between the two teams. The first happening eight years ago when BYU welcomed Cincinnati to Provo and took care of business with a 38-24 win. A year later, BYU traveled to Cincinnati, winning that game 20-3. But this time, 
it's within the Big 12 Conference. A little bit different this time around, Coach, as, yeah. as you take a look at Cincinnati, and you both are looking for your first Big 12 win. What jumps off the page or the screen when you watch Cincinnati play football? Their defensive line is outstanding, starting with their nose guard. Um, I think his last name is Corleone. Yep, Dante. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's Corleone or Cor Corleone, but he's, uh, he is one heck of a player. Their whole defensive front is outstanding. This is the this is uh, the best defense we played up to this point this season. They are disruptive, very physical, and fast, and we have our work cut out for us. Yeah, they they do have two losses, but again, uh, it hasn't really been the defense. Their, their offense has no, had some struggles getting going. Teams have not been able to run the ball on them. Oklahoma uh, really struggled to run the ball on them. Um, I think the only success they really had was a third and long run play where they kind of caught them off guard. They were dropping into pass coverage and a couple of quarterback runs, but they did a really nice job stopping Oklahoma in the run and um, kind of making them one dimensional. And so, yeah, it's going to be a, a real challenge, but we're excited for it. Yeah, I mean, based on our conversations and what you said and what they're going to bring to the table, this is quite the challenge for, for your offense and the run game specifically against Cincinnati. Yeah, this, this is what you play for, though. It's a conference game. It's a home game with our fans, you know, in, in our stadium. Um, you, this is why you play. I mean, a little adversity is good for you. You know, we're, we're, we're looking forward to it. We're 3-1. and one, trying to get our fourth win, and it's a one-game season, just trying to win Friday night. What is it about night games and BYU? Because in the Satake era, statistically speaking, it, BYU wins a ton of football games. What is it about the night scenario that's working so well for BYU? I just think we have great fans, you know, they, they really are the 12th player, you know, on the field for us. And, um, you know, when we get that energy in that stadium behind our team and the other team feels it working against them. And I just think about all the, the uh, crowd noise causing penalties, you know, on our opponents over the years. You know, I just there's been many times where our home crowd has either given us a boost or uh, made it difficult on the opponent. Well, Coach, we appreciate you spending some time with us this week. And uh, on a short week, I guess we'll finish with this. Toughest part of preparing for a short week in a Friday night game? Just very limited practice reps. You know, you have to get healthy again from a physical game Saturday. So you don't want to you don't want to hit too much. You, don't, you can't have too much contact. You have one less day. So it's a matter of uh, trying to get a game plan in with less practice reps and trying to be fresh and fast Friday night. So uh, I'm guessing maybe Bloody Tuesday, which is what a Tuesday practice might not be as yeah. bloody this week. Bloody Tuesday is probably not quite as bloody. <laughs> as bloody. Yeah. Coach, thanks again uh, for hanging out with us in Studio B for the insights into your team, and uh, we wish you the best of luck against Cincinnati on Friday night. Thanks. Good to be here. Can't wait for that electric atmosphere. Okay, that'll do it for the coordinator's corner. Uh, as always, thanks to the fabulous coaches that stopped by in studio to answer the tough questions. Today was Coach Hill and Coach Roderick. For now, I'm Spencer Linton. We'll see you next week. The Cougars taking on the Bearcats on Friday night. See you next time.